Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific writer at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installment in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series. It's entitled Evaluating the Differentiation Potential of Primary Airway Cells in 3D Models and is presented by Dr. Kevin Tayo. Dr. Tayo is a scientist at ATCC. In this presentation, Dr. Tayo will elucidate techniques and procedures that can help you reliably generate 3D airway models with consistent full epithelial differentiation. After the presentation, be sure to join us for a lively discussion as Kevin answers your questions. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Tayo. Thank you, Brian, for that kind introduction. Good day, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Kevin Tayo, a scientist at ATCC, and I would like to talk a little bit about fabricating 3D airway models. But before I start, I'd like to say a couple of words about ATCC. Founded in 1925, ATCC is a nonprofit organization headquartered in Manassas, Virginia, with an R&D and service center in Gaithersburg, Maryland. We are an innovative company that possesses the world's largest biological materials and information resources for cell culture. We serve as a global supplier of authenticated cell lines, including cells used to fabricate 3D airway models. In this presentation, I want to provide an overview of the methods used to generate 3D airway models that have appropriate model morphology and epithelial differentiation. Here, we will investigate potential differences in airway models comprised of either primary human bronchial tracheal epithelial cells, or HPECs, to HTERT immortalized cell lines. We will also look into lot to lot variation between different primary cell lots. We will also discuss how your choice of differentiation media can greatly affect model maturation and morphology. Finally, we also want to compare airway models generated from cells from either ATCC or other suppliers. Throughout this talk, we will also review common pitfalls in airway model fabrication. When we talk about airway models, we are referring to recapitulating a portion of the human respiratory tract. The respiratory tract is comprised of different regions. The upper respiratory tract, which includes the nasal cavity and pharynx, the lower respiratory tract containing the bronchial tracheal tract and small airways, and finally the distal tract, which refers to the alveoli. Each of these regions consists of specialized cells each having specific functions and facilitating air exchange. For our purposes today, we will be talking exclusively on models mimicking the bronchial tracheal tract using primary bronchial epithelial cells. Here, we will talk about how to properly induce differentiation to produce a mature airway model containing basal, goblet, and silated cells. I do want to mention that whatever region of the human respiratory tract your research focuses on, ATCC provides a wide array of primary cells to choose from. We have a variety of healthy cell lots available from different donors. Moreover, we can also provide disease airway cells as well, such as asthma, COPD, fibrosis, and cystic fibrosis. In addition, ATCC offers HTERT immortalized cells derived from either the bronchial tracheal tract or small airways. We take pride in our ability to offer you a wide array of cells to support your research. 
As I mentioned earlier, this talk is primarily focused on creating 3D array models comprised of primary HBECs. Here, we conducted a series of studies to investigate different parameters that can affect the maturation of these 3D models, as well as cause replicate variability. In our first set of studies, we wanted to investigate the role of media choice in affecting bronchial epithelial differentiation. Here, we tested four separate lots of primary bronchial epithelial cells and culture them with four different medias, complete bronchial growth media, an 80-20 mixture of complete bronchial and fibroblast growth medias, as well as ALI differentiation medias offered by either lifeline cell technology or stem cell technologies. In addition, we also investigated the usage of HTERT immortalized cell line newly won in creating ARI models. Moreover, we also wanted to investigate how the plate layout can affect replicate variability by either using all wells within a 24 well plate or just the interior wells only. Here, empty wells from these partial plates are filled with two mils of Dubelco's phosphate buffered saline or PBS. During these studies, weekly tear measurements and apical washings were conducted two weeks following ALI, which I'll speak more on the next slide. This slide provides an overview of the airway model fabrication process, which takes about five to six weeks to perform. This is why it's so important to cover all the different variables. First, we'll add a transwell inserts into our selected wells within a 24 row plate. Again, either using all of the wells or just the interior wells only. We then apically coat the transwell inserts with a hundred microliters of 0.3 mg per mil collagen solution and incubate the plates overnight at 4 degrees Celsius. Afterwards, we'll place the plates back into a biosafety cabinet and allow them to reach room temperature. We'll then wash the, the membranes uh, twice using PBS. We will then seed the bronchial epithelial cells at 100,000 cells per well at volumes of 200 microliters and then we'll add 0.5 mils of complete bronchial growth media to the basal side. We'll then incubate the cells for 48 to 72 hours to ensure complete cell confluency on the apical membrane of these transwell inserts. Once they're fully confluent, we'll remove the apical media, partially exposing the cells to air, hence air-liquid interface or ALI. We will also replace the basal media with our appropriate differentiation media. We'll then culture our cells for an additional four weeks under ALI conditions to ensure epithelial differentiation, replacing the basal media every other day. A few more notes on this. After two weeks of ALI incubation, we will perform weekly rinses on the apical side of the membrane to gently wash away any mucin produced, while being careful not to disturb the cell layer. This is important because excess mucin can affect model maturation as well as affect transmembrane testing. We also perform weekly tear measurements, which I'll cover more in detail later. First, I wanna talk about what these models look like during the air liquid interface culturing process. Here are some representative microscopy images taken right before ALI incubation, shown in image A, as well as one week after ALI, shown in B. At both time points, there is no discernible differences in cell morphology between cell lots, differentiation media, or even h controls, which was expected because no differentiation has taken place. However, after two weeks of ALI incubation, the cell morphology began to change depending upon the choice of media. Here we have representative images of cells incubated under ALI conditions for two weeks in either A, complete bronchial growth media, B, the 80-20 bronchial fibroblast mixture media, C, lifeline cell technology, and D, stem cell technology ALI medias. These differences became more pronounced as the ALI period progressed. Here, 
we ha- we show representative images of cells after five weeks of ALI incubation in different medias. It's important to note that these morphological differences were only observed in models incubated in the different medias. When grown in the same media, different primary cell lots share similar model morphology, as shown here in these representative images of the four different ATCC primary cell lots incubated in stem cell technologies ALI media. Another note in our microscopy imaging was that our newly won HTERC control cells exhibited morphologies far different from our primary cell lots. Specifically, these models were much darker, indicating the formation of multilayers. After the ALI culturing period concludes, you should be left with mature ARI models comprised of fully differentiated bronchial epithelial cells, possessing goblet, silated, and basal cells. One of the ways you can test your model is to conduct tight junction studies. Two widely used methods are conducting tear measurements, as well as assessing dextran transmembrane diffusion. TIR, which stands for transepithelial, transendothelial electrical resistivity, measures the electrical resistance by passing a charge between two points on a chopstick probe of an ohmmeter. The higher the resistivity, the higher the tight junction of the airway model. Another method to determine tight junctions, which we will show later in the talk, is to assess the transmembrane kinetics of a fluorescently labeled dextran. Here, we'll add the fluorescently labeled dextran to the apical side of the model and test how long it takes for the dextran to pass through into the basal media within a given time period. The greater the movement of dextran through an airway model into the basal media, the lower the relative model tight junction. Thus, increased dextran transmembrane movement is inversely proportional to tear values. Another important note is that previous studies have shown that airy models can possess high tear variance. If you take into account the surface area, tear values of bronchial cells can range from 400 to 4,000 ohms times centimeters squared. Although realistically, mature area models typically range from 400 to 1200 ohms times centimeters squared. This variability can be caused by a variety of different factors, including donor variability and media. What's important here is to not be alarmed if your primary cells don't share the exact same tier values shown here. As long as your area models have tier values above 400, you should be okay. So with that background out of the way, here is our tiered data from ARI models after five weeks of ALI culturing. This is a busy graph, but we can break it down. Here, we're looking at the total resistivity of four different lots of ATCC primary cells and our HTERP newly won controls, cultured in different medias shown on the x-axis. As we can see, media choice plays a major role in affecting the tier values with complete bronchial media demonstrating suboptimal resistivity relative to the other medias. Moreover, donor lot variability is present in all media groups. However, in all cases, models comprised of our newly won controls exhibit much lower resistivity relative to primary cell counterparts. This graph here shows the percent error of airy models grown in either full 24 row plates or in our interior walls only, our partial plates. Here, we compare two different primary cell lots incubated in either stem cell or lifeline ALI medias. As we can see, fabricating models within the interior walls only results in a significantly decreased replicate variability relative to the usage of full plates. This is due to the partial plates limiting the edge effect where we observe increased evaporation and temperature differences in the outer wells of plates. Following our tier studies, we wanted to observe mature model morphology. To do this, we performed histological assessments of cross sections of preserved area models. Afterwards, these sections are either H&E or Alshin blue stained to observe silated or goblet cells respectively. Here, 
we will show Alshan Blue stained images of our models. Here are our representative Alshan Blue stained histological images of area models incubated with various differentiation medias, with image A showing area models incubated in complete bronchial growth media, figure B showing models grown in 80-20 bronchial fibroblast mixture media, and C and D incubated in either lifeline cell technology or stem cell technology media respectively. Here, we see proper airy model formation in both lifeline and stem cell media due to the presence of both goblet and sided cells in these images. In addition, we also examined our HTERC controls. We see airy models comprised of newly won cells incubated in either lifeline media, shown in A, or stem cell media, shown in B. Although goblet cell formation was observed in models incubated in stem cell media, neither model exhibited proper model morphology. Following our first set of studies, we wanted to further investigate the fabrication process of bronchial airway models. Specifically, we wanted to compare airway models comprised of primary HPECs from either ATCC or from other suppliers. Here, models were generated using the optimized processes derived from the first set of studies, with models incubated in either stem cell media or their respective supplier differentiation media. When possible, we assess two lots from each supplier in addition to assessing three primary cell lots from ATCC. Here, we compare the tier values from airy models comprised of primary bronchial epithelial cells from either ATCC or other vendors incubated in either A, stem cell technology media, or B, their respective supplier ALI differentiation media. Although differences between lots and media choice was present, resistivity values for all models were acceptable. The only exception was lot one from supplier one, which showed low tier values both in stem cell technology media and the respective supplier differentiation media, indicating that the suboptimal tight junction and model formation for this specific lot. Next, we show the results from our fluorescently labeled dextran transmembrane diffusion analysis on selected area models incubated in either stem cell technologies media or other supplier ALI media. Again, tight junctions in models can be evaluated by comparing the rate of transmembrane diffusion of the fluorescent labeled dextran into the basal media. Here, we say that the rate of dextran diffusion was inversely proportional to the tier values and that decreased dextran basal concentrations were relative to increased model tier values and model tight junction. Mucin production here, in this case, muce 5 ac which is an indicator of epithelial differentiation, was also evaluated in selected airway models. Here, apical washes from airway models were collected and tested for mucin via ELISA. This graph shows that despite the presence of lot to lot variation, as well as media choice affecting the mucin concentrations, all tested airway models were able to produce mucin. Here, we show additional Alshin blue stained images of area models comprised of three different ATCC primary cell lots incubated in either stem cell technology media, shown in figures A through C, or lifeline cell technology media, shown in figures D through F. As we can see, all area models demonstrated acceptable model integrity with appropriate epithelial differentiation, showing the presence of both goblet and sided cells. Moreover, Little to no, no lot to lot differences were present between models. However, airy models incubated in stem cell media did show increased model thickness. Finally, we also performed histological analysis on airy models generated from other supplier primary cells. Here, we see representative images of airy models from two primary cell lots from supplier A, shown in figure. A and B respectively, two lots from supplier B shown in figure C and D, as well as one lot from supplier C shown in E. 
With the exception of one lot from supplier A, all airway models demonstrated acceptable model integrity with appropriate epithelial differentiation showing the presence of both goblet and silated cells. Moreover, little to no lot-to-lot -lot differences were present between models. In summary, airway models comprised of either ATCC or supplier cell lines were successfully generated. Differences between primary cell lots were present. However, media choice plays a much larger role in model maturation. Both commercial differentiation medias from stem cell technologies and lifeline cell technologies provided the best levels of epithelial differentiation. Replicate variability was minimized using our partial plates with PBS in the outer wells. Despite the presence of goblet cells using the stem cell technologies ALI maintenance media, HTERT newly won cells are not an appropriate substitute for primary bronchial epithelial cells in airway model fabrication. These results demonstrate that ATCC primary HPECs are an effective tool to generate airway models with appropriate epithelial differentiation, model morphology, and mature functionality for use in your research. This concludes my presentation. Thank you again for your time. I sincerely hope that this presentation was useful to you and your research. Again, we are here to support your research endeavors. If anyone in the audience has any questions, please feel free to ask. Brian or I will do our very best to answer them. Thank you again. Well, thank you, Kevin. In just a few moments, we'll begin our Q&A session. Uh, please use the chat function available through the webinar program to submit your questions. And remember, the, web, the recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. So it looks like we had a bunch of technical questions come in um, to start with. So, um, Kevin, uh, can you explain why did you use 0 0.3 mg per mil collagen concentration before seeding the cells? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Uh, so if you look at literature, it provides a range uh, going from uh, 0 0.03 to 0.3 mg per mil, uh, with the lower concentration being very common. Uh, so for in these studies, we wanted to ensure uh, complete coverage on these uh, PET membranes of, of this collagen. And again, you know, in this process, we'll wash away the excess collagen right before seeding. Um, and, you know, this concentration, uh, you know, is great because it allows the collagen to go on this membrane and allows the membrane to better mimic the extracellular matrix. So the cells are, you know, much happier uh, uh, growing and, and incubating on, on, these, uh, on these inserts. All right. And, um... Could you talk a bit about your reasoning for why you chose 100,000 cells um, for the cell seeding? Uh, that's another great question. Uh, so there was a previous study done uh, in the literature that uh, showed that there's a, a Goldilocks range uh, from 50,000 to 100,000 uh, of, of cells per well that really provides the best uh, quality results. And you know, if you think about this, if you were to decrease uh, the number of cells, it would just take a, a longer time uh, for these uh, cells to reach confluency on the uh, membrane. However, if you uh, add more than 100,000 cells, let's say uh, 200,000 cells per well, and this, of course, is on a 24-well plate insert, um, if you add that much cells uh, into these inserts, it will affect the overall morphology uh, and differentiation of these um, of these models, and that's because the cells, you know, they don't like to be on top of each other. Um, you have contact inhibition, and so you you really want to avoid uh, seeding uh, at cell densities above 100,000 cells per well. Again, at a 24 well plate. Okay, that that makes sense. Um, do you have any insight that you could share about what might have caused the morphological differences in the models with different media? Uh, yes. So um, 
each media uh, is designed and, and carefully selected uh, for its specific, the specific purpose, right? So there's selected concentrations or the presence of absence of nutrients or compounds. So for differentiation media, um, you typically see increased concentrations of things like retinoic acid or hydrocortisone and decreased concentrations of things like uh, uh, growth factors, right? And this is all relative to the growth media. So the presence in, or, or the changes of these concentrations will affect the overall morphology of cells. And this, of course, will change how these cells interact with each other, which will in turn affect the overall model morphology. Good, good. Um, now, th this next question, this is actually a question that I posed to you before. Um, would you expect the same results using HBEC? Um, 3KT H chart cells instead of newly one. So that's the, that's another um, H spec uh, um, cell line that ATCC provides that's been immortalized by uh, H chart. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so uh, we have done additional work uh, using uh, the H spec 3KT cell lines. Well, we don't show it here, but uh, that work also shows there's a suboptimal uh, tier values and suboptimal uh, model morphology. So neither of these two HTERT cells would be appropriate to create uh, airway models. So I guess to follow up with that, on that then, is HTERT a good airway model to use? Well, I think that... Um, I think that h -church cells have many uses. It's just not in creating these 3D airway models. So h -church cells are great for your normal everyday testing. Uh, one of the major advantages is that they can be cultured a very long time relative to primary cell cultures. Um, you know, primary cells may stop expanding after maybe the eighth or 10th passage, but the h -church, you know, uh, have been shown to be just fine even after 60 passages. And while they still retain Many of like the same uh, or similar, you know, physiological characteristics of of normal uh, primary cells. Right, right, and and actually, this just sort of jogged my memory. Um, some of our H uh, H chart models do do okay in an ALI um, type uh, uh, environment, right? So um, our Care CT um, H chart cells have been able to. Uh, form uh, epidermal um, layers like like you would expect. Like basically, they grew skin. Um, yeah, that's culture. correct. So so yeah, I mean, there's there just might not be something that we we figured out how to how to tweak the process maybe. Mm -hmm. So um, okay, good. Now um, just to sort of switch gears a little bit, we've had a couple questions come in uh, around measuring. Here, so I thought that I would um, throw, go ahead and bunch these together and throw them at you. Um, first of all, what are some other uh, variables that can affect tier value? That's a really great question. That's a question that has come up a lot. Uh, you know, tier uh, instrumentation is is a very simple tool to yield, to use, uh, or seemingly very simple, similar to a pH meter. Anyone who's ever dealt with a pH meter with a, a, a not a maintained probe or, or unmaintained probe will kind of understand the difficulties of having drifting values or, or inconsistency. Um, so I think a key thing is that you want to make sure, the first thing is to ensure that your probe is properly maintained. Uh, but there are other variables that can greatly affect uh, your tier value. So one thing is temperature. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we do is that we take the plate out of the incubator and allow it to reach room temperature for at least 30 minutes. Um, and we do the same thing too with the tier instrument. We turn it on and let it warm up and we ensure that uh, for our particular model, it has internal battery. Uh, so if we unplug it, it's, it's not gonna turn off, but it requires it to kind of warm up for 30 minutes. If you keep it plugged in, it will introduce uh, variability in your readings. Uh, another thing that's very important is uh, the pH of the media or even using old media. You want to ensure that when you're conducting tier measurements that you're replacing and using fresh media. You also want to uh, keep the probe, the chopstick probe, uh, and condition it inside of your uh, differentiation media uh, to get it to acclimate. 
Um, another thing that's very important too is actually how you hold the probe. Um, typically, you want to hold it upright. Uh, and another thing too is you want to make it consistent. So the height differences also matter. Uh, your, your, the volume of media can also be affected or uh, can also affect your tier values. Um, so again, you know, despite all these different things, you know, uh, a tier instrumentation is a very, uh, uh, I think it's a great instrument to kind of quickly and uh, non-intrusively measure your tight junctions of your models. Okay, good, good. Nice bit of troubleshooting advice there uh, also. So um, how do you calculate here? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so after taking into account all the different variables, as, as I mentioned in the, or answered the previous question, uh, you take your raw values of your area models, right, from the ohmmeter, and these are in ohms, that's the actual value units. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll actually blank subtract these using inserts that are true with media only. So I have a separate plate uh, that, that are full of collagen-coated inserts that have not been seeded with cells, and they'll go undergo the same conditions uh, as my airway model plates. And I only use those to, again, for use as blank, to take into account any resistivity by the media. So you conduct this blank subtraction. Now you're left with this corrected value um, that is specific to your area model. Now, another factor here is that you have surface area, right? Depending upon the cell insert size, that is going to affect the resistivity. So we take that into account by multiplying the surface area of the insert. So again, I'm using 24 plates here, and the surface area of that membrane is 0.33 centimeters squared, right? And so your final value uh, should be something like ohms times centimeters squared. And uh, just kind of an extra note here, uh, you know, from my understanding, you, you don't want to use anything larger than uh, 12 wall plate inserts. Uh, if you're trying to do something like a six wall plate insert, uh, just the way that the, the probe, you know, the dynamics of the instrument is, you're not going to necessarily get accurate results for that. So all of this should be appropriate for something like a 12, 24, and 48 wall plates. Okay, good, good. Uh, now, could you talk a bit about why there were um, tier differences between lots? Yes. So, uh, as we recall, the tier differences, uh, we saw variances from two things. First was that we saw, um, you know, differences uh, from the same primary cell lots but using different medias, and again, uh, that media can will, will cause some variations we talked about, but there was also lot to lot variation, and uh, the lot to lot variation uh, is coming from the fact that each of these lots are coming from a specific donor. So uh, in these studies, these lots are from donors that have different age groups as well as uh, different genders, um, and so e even though that you will see lot to lot variation. Um, you know, you can still use these models to, you know, for, let's say, toxicology studies to assess viability or changes in inflammation. And so you'll see, for example, absolute values may change, you know, from lot to lot, but the overall trends should still be the same. Okay. Good, good. Um, all right. Uh, this, this next question is actually around dextran. So can you change the size of dextrin in your tight junction studies? Uh, yes. Um, so other studies have used different size dextran. So what happens is if you, let's say, decrease the molecular weight, you'll see an increased amount of transmembrane movement of that dextran into the basal layer, right, within, that, within a uh, relative to, you know, the 40 kilodalton one within that same time frame. Okay. Uh, conversely, larger molecular weights will require a more prolonged periods of incubation before that basal level dextran uh, concentrations, reason, you know, reaches uh, you know similar concentration to what we've seen. So I think that your best bet would be to use something like 40 kilodaltons or smaller, and that would allow you to you know, uh, you know more quickly assess um, uh, you know the differences in tight junction. Okay. Good. Good. Um, all right, the, the next uh, couple questions that came in, uh, I'm going to ask are around passage number. 
Okay, so the first one, um, what is the passage number of the cells when you seeded them onto the membrane? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we passage or, or subculture these cells twice prior to seeding. So first, we'll thaw the cells um, into a T75 flask and allow them to reach a confluency uh, right around 85%. We'll then subculture them uh, into either a larger or multiple flask, you know, depending upon how many cells we require for these studies. Um, and once they have reached that appropriate confluency, again, something around 80 to 90 percent, we subculture them a second time and use those disassociated cells to seed uh, the inserts. So okay. long story short, it should just be two passages. <laughs> All right, that makes sense for, for um, primary cells. Um, I guess that kind of leads into then does passage number matter in cell models? And you can um, speak specifically to primary cells, and then you can talk broadly um, about models in general. Sure. Uh, so for primary cells, uh, there has a, been a previous study that have shown that uh, using cells that have been passed more than four times uh, results in area models with suboptimal thickness and morphology. So you really want to keep it down, uh, you know, want to use something of a passage of, of you know, two to three. Um, that would be reasonable. But again, anything more than that, you're probably going to be wasting your time. And again, keep in mind, these things takes five weeks to, to mature. So, you know, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, more broadly, uh, that is the advantage of HTERT cells, uh, is that, you know, unlike primary cells, which have sort of a limited proliferative, you know, capability, HTERT cells and, you know, other applications have shown that, um, you know, they're able to go on and, and definitely, and again, retain you know, similar physiological characteristics. Okay, that, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, can disease models be created as well? Uh, I know ATCC provides um, disease uh, uh, airway cells, primary cells. Um, is, is that something that could be created? Uh, is that something that you've tried? We haven't tried it firsthand, but we, you should be able to construct uh, diseased models, you know, using a similar method as described, you know, here. Um, you know, obviously the properties of these models will be very different compared to healthy cells. So an example would be that you'd see maybe increased inflammation or mucin production with some of the disease models. So that might require additional, like, washings, um, you know, apical washings more than just a week, right, to remove any sort of excess mucin. Uh, and, and you're right, like we do carry a variety of different cell lines available for, for these purposes. Okay. And and then um, can this method be used for co-culture models as well, like including maybe fibroblasts um, in it? Yes. So the good news is that this can be used as the basis to for cold culture models. Again, I think that if you look at cold culture models or just area models in general, um, the lag step is the differentiation of these bronchial epithelial cells. Uh, so for the incorporation of fibroblasts, you would actually add them uh, in a modified collagen solution prior to bronchial cell seeding. Um, and again, they would still have to undergo ALI for the bronchial cells to, or ep, the bronchial epithelial cells to differentiate, but you can include uh, fibroblasts, right? Um, in addition, uh, another, uh, uh, you know, popular way is to incorporate endothelial cells. And what you would do there is that uh, you would actually um, turn the inserts upside down and you would seed the endothelial cells on the basal side of the membrane. And once they're attached, you put those back in the wells, and then you would, you know, add your, um, you would seed your bronchial epithelial cells. So, you know, this method, as I, as I mentioned, this can be used as the foundation to incorporate additional cell lines. Cool, cool. Making a more physiologically relevant model, I guess. Correct. Uh, in the process. I like it. <laughs> okay. Um, this next. Asker has two questions. I'll start out with the first one. What do non-tight junctions mean? 
So non-tight junctions or, or subdoptimal type junction means that there's probably some type of bare spots on your membrane where the cells aren't present. And so um, that's not great because you have a bare spot and it will allow the basal media to come through. Again, these pores have, um, I'm sorry, these membranes have, have pores on them and it will allow the media to slowly migrate. And what will happen is, is that you'll actually have um, a layer of media covering the cells so you're no longer having a uh, air liquid interface. So you don't want to have that. That's, that's something um, that will kind of ruin your models. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, I guess that kind of relates to the, the next question from this asker. So um, they say, my lab caused the filters leaky when there is fluid on top of the filters after being taken to ALI. What does this mean? Um, and what does that mean if it happens within the first few days after being taken to ALI? That's, that's a great question because I'm, I'm, uh, the first few days would indicate that there are bare spots. If it was something that happens, let's say, two or three weeks afterwards, that's probably something that, was, that occurred during the handling of these models. So, for example, if you're conducting those weekly washes, or maybe you're too aggressive with the tear measurements, you might have induced some type of a wound or cut on those area models, you know, resulting in a bare spot. Um, so I think to prevent uh, the bare spots from first occurring is to ensure that you have complete cell confluency prior to um, uh, uh, creating the air liquid interface culturing. So I think a key thing is that, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that even after, let's say, rigorously shaking or, or moving to distribute the cells on these uh, membranes, you still want to keep a, a close look at the corners of these inserts um, because sometimes you'll have uh, the cells localized in the center and not on the edges. So right before you choose to go to, into ALI, if you see that there may be some small residual bare spots on the um, – on the corner of these uh, inserts, it's okay to, to wait an extra day or, or change the media as well uh, to ensure that, again, you want complete confluency because any bare spot you know, that's large enough will, in, will cause that leakage to occur. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, um, now for this next question, I think you kind of alluded to um, the answer in the negative um, earlier but um, maybe you could um, explain it in, with regards to just what there is in the literature. Um, so I'm interested in studying disease in a dish, in particular COPD. Do you know if COPD bronchial epithelial cells are grown and differentiate at ALI? Uh, will they form diseased epithelium phenotypes, such as basal cell or mucous cell hyperplasia, and if not, do you know if there are injury models that can approximate hyperplasia phenotype? That's a, that's a really great question. I haven't had the opportunity to, to test that out. Um, I'm trying to think there should be I – don't, I don't remember if there was anything in literature for that specific um, – We would love to know if you find out, though, if um, <laughs> yeah. to the actor. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I'll look that up. That's actually really interesting. Okay. Um, well, let's go ahead and jump to the next question. Um, does ATCC provide ALI media? Uh, no, we do not, but we do provide the initial growth media. Okay. And um, let's see. How do small airway epithelial cells form ALI relative to the bronchial epithelial cells? That's a great question. Um, they will, uh, the, the procedure for small airway epithelial cells um, is pretty much the same uh, as, uh, as, as bronchial epithelial cells. Um, it's pretty much the same conditions. Uh, the, the growth media, uh, we actually uh, ATCC provides uh, um, growth media that is both compatible with small airway cells as well as the bronchial cells. Um, I do think that for the differentiation media, 
Uh, I do believe that there are commercial uh, medias that are specific to small airway cells. That's the only change that you would uh, have to see. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, now this next question is um, an exercise in multitasking. So, Kevin, can you measure tear, transmembrane diffusion, and fixation for immunohistochemistry in the same well? The answer is yes, but only if you organize it correctly. So tier measurements are, again, non-destructive. Uh, you can run that, uh, and uh, that will be fine. Uh, transmembrane diffusion, again, is non-destructive. The only thing that you would have to do is make sure that you rinse both the apical and basal side from any residual uh, fluorescent labeled dextran. And I think that is something more of akin of, you just don't want your, your, your model to look green for a prolonged period of time, I think. Um, <laughs> now the fixation, you can do that, but that is a destructive uh, method. So that would be typically done at the end of your studies. Um, so long as, as you have performed the tier and diffusion, um, you know, uh, methods correctly, as in not disturbing or disrupting the model integrity, you can use that same replicate or sample uh, to fixate and perform your histology measurements. All right, good answer, good answer. Okay, um, Kevin, did you notice that any gender effect? Did both um, genders, um, you know, cells from both genders respond similarly? Um, that's a great question. Uh, that will have to be something to be investigated more in detail. That would be very interesting to see, you know, in a much more comprehensive study using a much larger number of lots. But in this particular case, we didn't see a, a major difference uh, from, from effects of gender. We did see, again, lot to lot variation, but the gender, uh, the gender didn't seem to play a role in that. But again, that would be very interesting to see. Uh, you know, again, a more comprehensive study because, again, another one of the variables that we looked at uh, was, or, or that was present, I should say, uh, was that there were different ages. Oh, right, right. That, that could make a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because younger cells uh, tend to do better in culture, I mean, especially primary cells, than, than mm -hmm. cells from an older donor, right? Mm hmm um, okay. All right. Um, now, here's another question that kind of goes back to, you know, the, um, the co-culture model that, that uh, I asked earlier. Um, so, I'm pretty sure that you would answer this in the negative, but have, have you tried maintaining the um, primary lung epithelial cells with, like, pulmonary neuroendocrine cells? Uh, unfortunately not. We, the, we have done some cold culture studies with the uh, primary and HTERT uh, bronchial epithelial cells with lung fibroblasts, um, but we haven't done um, any other cell types yet. Okay. Uh, alrighty. Um, have you noticed any differences between providers of trans wells? So um, the, the asker goes on to mention that I've noticed different companies have different plastic and design of trans well, even if they are all 0 0.4 uh, micron and 24 well inserts. That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, no, we've, uh, during the study, um, we only used uh, inserts from Corning. Um, and that was to uh, specifically uh, eliminate that extra variable. Okay. Uh, in fact, though, that particular, um, it, it seems to me that in literature, that was the most popular uh, brand, uh, the Corning 24-plate uh, uh, inserts with the 0.4 micron uh, pore size. Okay. All right. This next uh, question I'm going to take for you, Kevin, and give you a quick breather. But um, it asks if we can show again a picture of the cells plated on trans wells um, when confluent enough to raise to ALI. 
Um, what uh, we actually can't do that using the ON24 program, sadly, but the presentation will be on the ATCC website uh, by tomorrow. And um, we can also send you the slide set if you would like. Okay, um, let's see. I'll go ahead and jump to the next question. Um, are there any good protein markers for fully differentiated airway epithelium? Yes. Um, so, uh, again, the fully differentiated epithelial cells, right, are going to be comprised of three different cell populations. You, you would have basal, goblet, and sided cells. And so for goblet cells, you know, they produce mucin, and you can actually, uh, you know, test for the presence of, uh, or, or even stain for imaging of things like uh, MUSE5AC, and I believe uh, uh, MUSE5B, uh, I believe. Um, and for uh, uh, silented cells, uh, you know, they're characterized by having these little cilia, right? Um, so you can stain for alpha tubulin. Um, and that will show, selectively show and, and stain um, the cited cells in your airway model. So that's actually how you can, by using both of those staining methods, you know, you can ensure and confirm that, yes, you have a fully differentiated um, airway model. Nice, nice. All right, um, let's see. Um, another couple of co-culture questions. Um, have you tried comparing cytokine production from primary cells, um, comparing different media? So they go on to say that they noticed that um, w one uh, media provider appears to elevate um, IL-8 in media and apical secretion. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, Uh, Are you still so we oh, did, okay. yeah, oh, hello, yeah, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so um, we did look at, um, you know, cytokine production, um, but uh, we didn't, we didn't go into necessarily detail to see what are the actual effects uh, of the media uh, for that particular thing. We just, it was more of a functional. Um, so, uh, that that that's a great question. That would be something that we would have to investigate further to see, you know, to give you a definitive answer of, oh yes, this media does cause increased, uh, you know, maybe baseline inflammation. Okay. Now, if the bronchial epithelial cells are maintained in differentiation media instead of at ALI, do you see any differentiation? Have you seen any morphological changes? That's that's a great question. I um, I think though so, that with differentiation media alone, let's just say that you want to just add differentiation media to let's say a T75 flask. I think without the exposure, the partial exposure to air, you won't see um, the uh, differentiation. In fact, I I would anticipate that you probably wouldn't see too much cell growth at that point because of the absence of like uh, the uh, uh, growth factors. Um, so in order to actually properly ensure differentiation, not only do you have to use, um, you know, differentiation, but you also have to ensure uh, the, the ability of the air liquid interface. That's why, I guess, to go back to it, um, uh, why it's so important not to have leaky models, right? That's why you want to ensure there's full confluency um, of, of the cells on those uh, membrane inserts. Uh, as well as to ensure you don't scrape anything off during your, you know, routine, you know, tear or tight junction studies. Okay, good, good. Um, now, here's a question that's directly about the primary cell product. Okay, so the primary cells that ATCC provides, are they the same as in vivo, or have we modified them in any way? To, to turn them into a, a proper cell line. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so, uh, 
They are the same as in vivo. Uh, they're, they're just uh, collected to ensure that, again, you're only having your, um, your, your bronchial epithelial cells and that they're free from any type of contaminants. Um, but they are equivalent to like what you would see in vivo. Okay. Um, now, just sort of generally speaking, what about cell lines versus primary cells? Will um, and you can just speak on any cell line that you may um, know of anecdotally. Uh, will they um, uh, form an alveolar model in 3D uh, ALI culture? Well, I haven't had the opportunity to work with the al alveolar models, so I don't believe that they actually uh, under uh, require ALI differentiation. I'm not, don't quote me on it because I'm not too familiar with that, but I would anticipate that any type of physiologically relevant model would require the use of, uh, of primary cells. And just because of the, you know, the, your, your continuous cell lines, they'll just continue to grow. Um, you know, we see, and, um, Whereas, like primary cells, there tends to be some type of, uh, you know, once they reach confluency, there there tends to be that um, uh, growth inhibition, right, from that contact inhibition. So I would I would think that for any again for any 3D model that you work on, it would to ensure you know physiological relevance uh, as as well as just to have a stable model, it would be more appropriate to use primary cells. And you see this a lot with other targets. Um, where as you're, you know, trying to create a more physiologically relevant model, the more stable those models tend to be as well. Okay, good, good. Now we're coming close um, to time, so I'm going to um, ask two more questions and then close. So um, how manipulatable are the differentiated epithelial cells? I mean, um, have you heard of anyone using like a CRISPR-Cas9 strategy to manipulate the genes once the cells have been differentiated? Hmm. Um, I think without I have thinking not. hard about it, you, the, yeah. the first problem that you have to get over is um, differentiated cells are, are difficult to transfect, right? Yeah. So the first thing you gotta do is get the DNA in there in the first place, and I mean, there's there's definitely some viral strategies you can take, um, but but other than that, though, I mean, usually you would probably want to try and get them catch them before they differentiated, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and then um, the. The next question I want to ask, uh, Kevin, can you talk about what medium um, that ATCC is using for expanding primary bronchial epithelial cells? Uh, yes. Um, so to expand uh, the cells, um, you would use, uh, I, I call it uh, complete growth media, and it consists of uh, ATCC's uh, airway epithelial uh, cell basal medium, so that's in a 500 mil bottle, uh, and we supplement that with a bronchial epithelial cell growth kit, and that's actually a kit that has, I think, four or five different components, um, and we would add that to uh, the media, and you can to you can you do have the option to uh, add something like a five mils of like penicillin streptomycin solution uh, that you know again inhibits like um, uh, you know, bacterial growth if you're worried about your aseptic technique. And again, you know, I'm not going to judge you on that because these things do, you know, they do require something like five weeks of culturing, right, to get your fully finished product. But again, it's it's the combination of, of that airway epithelial cell basal medium and the bronchial epithelial cell growth kit. That's, those are what you'll actually need to uh, grow and expand your uh, the primary cell lines. All right. Good, good. Okay, well, um, at this time, we'll conclude our Q&A session. So, first of all, I'd like to thank Kevin for the excellent presentation and, and handling everyone's questions, and thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar. Uh, be sure to join us for more exciting and informative webinars in 2022, um, 
Kevin's going to be coming back on November 2nd. Um, so bad on me. I made a mistake on the slide. It says November 3rd. November 2nd is the date uh, where he will be talking about if differentiation matters, comparing the toxicological response between airway epithelial cells. And then uh, October 13th, uh, John Folk will give his talk on luciferase reporter cancer cell lines and how they can help facilitate your CAR T development. And um, then finally, I'd like to um, add as a shameless bit of self promotion, ATCC has a podcast called Behind the Biology, uh, where we interview um, the latest, uh, or we interview scientists about their uh, latest breakthroughs, um, great, great stories, 20 minutes at a time. So um, uh, at any rate, thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.